Good morning, church. It is a beautiful Sunday morning here in our part of Tennessee, and I hope things are well for you in your part of Tennessee. We miss you and can't wait to see you again, no matter what the weather is like over on your side. We're still in the season of Easter, and that's where we focus on the resurrection of Jesus and what that means for us and, and for the world. And one of the things that happens during the season of Easter that uh, we haven't paid a lot of attention to this year as we've looked in the Gospels of Matthew and John is oftentimes we'll spend time in the book of Acts, the season of Easter as well. And that's because it's a continuation of what happens when Jesus is resurrected. He has defeated the grave. He has defeated death. He has come back and made a, um, a solid, the defining victory for God's life over the brokenness of the world and acts is where God through his spirit and his people now spread out into the world to declare that message and to begin to make that change for life against death. And so our text today comes from Acts 17. Acts 17 is where Paul goes into Athens, the cultural and intellectual and um, philosophical center of his world and he declares the kingdom of God and there are a lot of things we could say about that text it is a rich text and maybe someday we'll spend a lot more time on it but today just want to um, make a basic observation and offer an opportunity for us to interact with the text just a little bit and so uh, let's begin just by reading the text this is Acts 17 and uh, we'll start in verse 16. And so just kind of settle into a comfortable place and hear the word of God. While Paul waited for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to find that the city was flooded with idols. He began to interact with the Jews and Gentile God worshipers in the synagogue, and he also addressed whoever happened to be in the marketplace each day. And certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers engaged him in discussion, too. Some said, what an amateur. What's he trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. They said this because he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him into custody and brought him to the council on Mars Hill. What is this new teaching? Can we learn what you're talking about? You've told us some strange things, and we want to know what they mean. They said this because all Athenians, as well as foreigners who live in Athens, used to spend their time doing nothing but talking about or listening to the newest thing. So Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What you worship was unknown, I now proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made with human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed something since he is the one who gives life and breath and everything else. From one person, God created every human nation to live on the whole earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. God made the nations so they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In God we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, as God's offspring, we have no need to imagine that the divine being is like a gold, silver, or stone image made by human skill and thought. God overlooks ignorance of these things in times past, but now directs everyone everywhere to change their hearts and lives. This is because God has set a day when he intends to judge the world justly by a man he has appointed, and God has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So like I said, there are a lot of things in this text that we could talk about. Uh, one thing to get up to the observation that I want to make today that we probably should point out by way of context 
is that Paul was speaking into a world that is not actually all that different from our world. Uh, Paul was in Athens, and we've already said that is the religious or the intellectual and the philosophical capital of the world. But in their world, that also meant it was one of the religious capitals of the world. There were um, gods on every hand and gods on every corner. And as he goes around Athens looking at all of various shrines and temples and places of worship for all of these various gods, then he stumbles across this one even, uh, the shrine or the temple, the place of worship to the unknown god. In the Athenian mind, uh, they were so religious, they were so dedicated to their philosophies and their way of life that they wanted to make sure that they didn't miss anyone. So they set up a shrine for the god that they had inevitably missed. So they lived in a world with lots of gods. Now, in our world, we don't call our gods by the same name. We don't call them Mammon or Athena or Mars or Zeus or whoever, but we have our gods just the same. Uh, we worship money and success and popularity and comfort and security and lust. We worship war and domination and things like that. We live in a world where every time we open our eyes, we have a siren call coming from almost every direction trying to pull us in that direction, some force something saying this is the path to life as it's intended to be. This is what things are supposed to be like. Just follow us and then everything will be okay. This is not a terribly different world than Paul lived in where everyone is peddling the meaning of life, the way things really are. But it's in the midst of this world and this is, um, as I was thinking about this text this week, this is what came to me kind of as a, a central thought that I want to ask you to focus on this morning and perhaps even this week, that in the midst of this world with all of these clarion calls, all of these siren voices pulling us this direction and the other direction, all of them making claims about the meaning of life and how we find fulfillment and what it means to flourish and what life is all about, um, there is that unknown God, the one who actually created the heavens and the earth, the one who knows what it is for us to flourish, who knows why we exist, who knows what the good life is, and is tenaciously committed to us enough not to throw us away, but to bring that good life to us if we are willing to accept it. And in Paul's world, um, those other gods were often aloof, and mysterious and hard to find. They were often the sorts of gods that hid themselves and disguised themselves and ran away. But this God is a God who, although he is mysterious and although you have to seek, he is a God that wants to be found. Those other gods, just by the way, were probably mysterious because they were full of empty promises. They always just slipped out of your grasp, always slipped just through your fingers, always just out of reach, always just on the tip of your tongue. But the God that Paul describes, this unknown God, I think the beautiful truth that we want to reckon with this morning is a God that wants to be found. For all of the mystery, and make no mistake, there is mystery with God. He's far bigger than anything that we could ever put into a box or to organize or to understand. But for all of the mystery of God and all of the complexity of God and all of the ways in which we must seek God, Paul says fundamentally he is a God that wants to, desires to, is tenaciously committed to being found. Because when we find him is when we find life. We find meaning and we find purpose, and we find flourishing in all of those things we are created for. And so Paul says that he's placed us here so that we um, may seek him, so that we may reach out for him, that we may find him, and that he's not far off, as a matter of fact. One of the things that I started thinking about this week as I was pondering this text is how God really is all around us. Um, every morning, or at least almost every morning, 
do a morning prayer. I've told you guys about this before, but we always start off that morning prayer with silence. And the practice of silence is a wonderful thing. And when we enter into this practice of silence, I always do it with this line that was taught to me by John Mark Hicks. Uh, As he was leading us through a time of prayer once, he uh, brought us into a period of silence. And he said, just take deep breaths. And he said, remember, with every breath you take, you are in communion with God. And that silence that we practice every morning is very simply for the purpose of remembering that God is with us. I get up in the morning and I'm already so far out into my day in my head. I've got to be at work by this point. And when I get to work, there's going to be this thing that needs to be done. Then this patient is going to be there then. And then we're going to have to do this thing. And I've got to get this thing done. And then when I come home, I've got to get this thing done. And don't forget, we've got that meeting tonight at this time on Zoom. And then we've got to get in bed by this time for tomorrow so we can get this thing done. And I'm so far in my head in my past, I can't believe that I did that. Or did you hear what I said to them? Or I wish I had that thing to do over. Or why didn't I get that thing done? I'm so far in my head, either one direction or the other, by the time I get up, that I forget to be, you know, right here. I forget to be in the present moment with the things around me. Most often that time of morning when I'm trying to do morning prayer, it's kittens rampaging through the house, playing and having a good time. It's birds singing outside of my window. It's the dogs running around. It's the sun shining down through the leaves. It's the breeze blowing. And I forget that it's in that moment that God is all around us. That God is with us and that he wants to be found. But the problem I have, the problem we have, I think, I don't suspect that I'm alone in this, is that we get so focused on chasing all of these other things that we forget that the one thing that is necessary to chase for life is God. And that God wants to be caught. And so I've got to, as the young kids say these days, got to get that bread, which is the way that they say we've got to go work and got to go earn our keep and got to go be successful and got to go get our money i got to go get that bread, and sometimes I get so caught up getting that bread, chasing that dream, getting the next thing, that I forget that all of those things are temporary, and transient, and ethereal. They will slip through your fingers if you place your life in the hands of the gods of success and wealth and money. But it's in the pursuit of those things that I'm really at the depth of who I am, pursuing things that only God can fulfill. What do I want when I want those things? I want to have some sort of meaning. I want to feel like I'm doing something worthwhile, whether that be doing a job that is meaningful or taking care of my family or doing something that people will remember me by or saying, oh, you did a good job praising me. You will be loved. Or or I want to have comfort. And I suppose it will come in a, a nicer bed or a softer couch or a new gadget I want to feel accomplished. And what I've discovered is that when I chase those things, those sorts of feelings may last for a while, but they always sort of fade. Those gods always make promises that sound good, but they're sort of empty. But the truth that I'm trying to lean into is that the God of Acts 17, the God who wants to be found is the God who ultimately can provide all of those things that I'm seeking in these false gods. I want a sense of worth and I want a sense of meaning and ultimately anything that I do, any place I store up my treasure here below um, can be destroyed or corrupted. It can be stolen as Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 6. But true and unending worth is found in three simple words. God loves me. He has already taken, as Jonathan Stormont, one of the preachers I like to listen to, says, he's already taken the question of my worth out of my hands and he has decided in my favor. And so it's an invitation to look past all of those false gods with their false promises, to place them back in their proper order in God's creation and to use them for what they were made for instead of letting them use us and rather see 
the real God, the God that wants to be found. And I don't remember who said this. Uh, it has traditionally been accredited to G.K. Chesterton, the uh, famous Anglican and Catholic author from Britain uh, from some time back, but G.K. Chesterton didn't say this, but it's a good quote nonetheless. It says that every time someone knocks on the door to a brothel, they are really seeking God. They're looking for something. They're looking in all of the wrong places, and we let ourselves get distracted. But God is there. Every breath we take is communion with God. Every time we see the sunshine, every time we feel the breeze, even in the darkest of the night, nights when we put our feet firmly on the ground, that is the presence of God. And he wants to be found. And so for just a minute, let's enter into an exercise. I've been trying to think of ways to get us more interactive in this. I don't like this virtual thing. Um, I want you just to settle in for a second. I want you to think about what Paul is telling the people here in Acts 17. God placed us here to seek him and to reach out for him that he can be found, that he's not far from us, that actually he took the initiative, that he wants to be found. And I want to ask you to consider this morning, what are the places in your life that are so busy or so cluttered or so full of anxiety what are the places in your life that are distracting you from finding the God who is right in front of you? And so just settle in for a second. What is keeping you from finding God? What is keeping you from seeing Him in your life? Maybe it's something from your past maybe it's something from the future that you've got to get done maybe you're worried about your security or your comfort or you're anxious about what's going to happen or what hasn't happened maybe you have fallen into the sway of some false god who talks a good game but you're already starting to see through the guise that that next thing is not as shiny as it promised to be or as life altering as it was meant to be that that pleasure that you were sure would give you what you were looking for has faded that having more money didn't fix all of your problems that that next experience didn't bring meaning to your life or fill up that emptiness whatever it is just name one two three things that have been calling to you been calling you away from the God that is in front of you but as you search for them, you can actually find the God that is there all along. Take just a minute to talk to God about those things, just on your own, and then we'll pray. God in heaven, give us the presence to see you around us. Give us the courage and the tenacity to seek you, knowing that you want to be found. Father, guide us 
give us eyes that see and hear ears that hear and hearts that understand and we pray with you or pray to you as a family now our father who art in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever amen you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first and great commandment. And a second one like it is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. If anyone says, back up a little, we love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates a brother or sister, he is a liar. Because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who can't or can be seen can't love God who can't be seen. This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brothers and sisters also. Church, we'll see you soon. We love you. We miss you. Have a good week.